want to welcome you to Meadow Park. I'm so glad that you're with us today. This is a great place to be and it's great to be together for worship. Uh, at Meadow Park, we believe that life lived to the fullest where you get the most out of life is with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I hope that if you don't have that relationship that today, maybe you encounter him and you begin that those first steps in that relationship. Or maybe you've been in this for a long, long time, but wherever you're at, we're so glad that you're with us. This is gonna be a great day. If you are new to Meadow Park, I want to encourage you to go to meadowpark.org forward slash connect and, and let us know you're here. And uh, it's a way for us to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have about the church. I want to just say thank you to everyone who so faithfully gives. We get to be a part of what God is doing in Columbus and around the world when you faithfully give. And so thank you so much for doing that. It's awesome to see how God takes those gifts and does great things with them. Today, I wanna just encourage you. We have got an amazing new series that we're in, Hang 10, where we're looking at the 10 commandments and uh, God speaks to us powerfully through those. Sometimes people see these as restrictive and, and the reality is that it's actually God providing boundaries that help us to live this amazing relationship with Him and it truly communicates His love for us. And so I pray that today we just uh, encounter Him and that our hearts are open and, and hear His word today. Let's just ask God to be in this time and just to be with us. God, thanks so much for this day. We thank you for your presence in this place. And I just thank you, God, for what you're gonna do in this space and time. I pray, God, that our ears and hearts are open and we just give this day to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sunday morning. Sing with us. We are Sea of Voices. We are a sea of voices. We are an ocean of your grace. Gathered under one name. We are a tide that's rising and we cannot be contained. See 
Today, we continue a series we began last week called Hang 10, where we're looking at the 10 commandments, the well-known 10 commandments in the Old Testament. At least we know of them, whether or not we know them, we'll find out here in just a minute. But we just want to have, uh, you know, as we're entering the summer, unofficial start of summer here after uh, Memorial Day, we just thought a series in the summer of just kind of thinking about palm trees and surfing, giving us a little bit of taste of, uh, of the freedom of the, the coast and the sun and the sand would just lift all of our spirits after being in quarantine for so long, and, uh, but we thought we'd wrap that around the, the Ten Commandments. You see, hang ten is this idea, is if you grew up in surfing culture, maybe you know about it, is the idea of hanging your ten toes over the edge of the board, a surfboard, a longboard when you're surfing, to walk up to the front and hang them over the, the front. And the idea is just, uh, and it represents a culture of just uh, relaxing and, and living in freedom, and I think that's exactly what I want to convey in this series and what we want to share with the series on the Ten Commandments that God is a God of freedom and that he's not trying to limit us, but that he wants us to grow in relationship and freedom with him. And so today we're going to continue on and we're going to be looking at the second commandment um, in these commandments uh, as, we, as we were working our way through. But before I jump into that, today also marks three months since we first uh, closed our, our live in-person services. Can you believe it? Three months it was uh, the first Sunday, it was March 15th that we had to close the doors because of the virus and, and its onset. And in the beginning, it was the idea of, man, just maybe we'll be closed for a couple of weeks and uh, then we'll reopen. And then it was, okay, at least through Easter. And then it was through Mother's Day. And it's hard to believe it's been three months already. So much has happened. Today, we are beginning our in person live services with one service, and we're going to be adding service as we have opportunity. And so it really marks a season that we've just come through. And I just want to say thank you to so many people, everyone that's been watching, everyone that's been joining in. Thank you so much for being a part of what God has continued to do during this time through Meadow Park and in our community, in our world, for giving us the opportunity to just speak hope and love and to stay connected through technology. It's been difficult, but it's also great to know we can also now begin taking steps to gather together, albeit with uh, safety precautions and and all of those pieces in place. And we hope that um, in time, uh, each of us will feel comfortable and be in a place where we can begin to regather and see each other in person as some are beginning to do today. I just want to also just say, again, thank you to all that have made these last three months possible, that Meadow Park has continued to be able to do ministry in effective ways. I'm I'm so grateful for our team, for our staff, first and foremost, who who I get to spend time with, and and even though much of it has, and most of it has been uh, through Zoom meetings, but just continuing to keep the ministry going. I think about these online services that we had to jump to right away. How awesome uh, that, that we had a team. We think about Roger leading worship and pulling our worship ministries team, the singers, the musicians together, uh, Josh Keating doing the production and technology to put all of this together to create these wonderful experiences for us. I am so thankful for their time and commitment. And I think about all the ministries that have had to go to digital platforms from our children's ministry with Josh uh, Lyle and and think about Judy and Jessica and and creating these great um, online experiences for our kids and connecting through newsletters and encouraging parents. Thank you. Think about our student ministry, Steve Almquist and and the great volunteers and teams that that serve in our student ministry that, that continue to lead the D teams and are putting great content out and fun experiences. You've really done an, an amazing job. I think about Diane uh, Thatcher and just leading our community groups and our care and, and continuing to, to meet the needs of those in our congregation as we've celebrated births and have come alongside people through death and, and struggle and challenge, continuing to pray as a, as, a, as a staff and as a congregation for one another. And then meeting, uh, again, the groups just meeting online. Thank you for all of you group leaders who've taken that step to, to move to those platforms, to continue to call the people in your groups. I'm so grateful for those steps you've, you've taken. I think about our outreach that's continued as we've been able to uh, serve meals and distribute meals in the community. We've raised money for, for masks for a nursing home right down the street, and, and you stepped up and exceeded our $1,500 goal. We're already over $2,000. Thank you for your generosity to help in those causes. Our Dollar Club's been able to help some families right here locally as we've partnered with Iglesia Shalom, our Hispanic congregation, to provide needs for uh, some meals for some families that are especially struggling right now. So all these different ways, thank you for what you're doing. Our directors and our children's center, Sandy and, and Jen, and I think about Ray and our facilities team that have kept things ready and clean. And as we've opened up for our, our, our children's center this past week, 
everyone's just doing such a tremendous job. And now we're figuring out those next steps. And so um, we're going to continue to offer the best we can online for you to be able to worship and to hear God's word. But we also look forward to adding services to allow ourselves to connect with one another. We know that it's such a vital uh, value for us of belonging is to be able to see with, and be with one another and to worship together. So three months and uh, God is good. God has continued to guide and we are in this together. God is guiding us. As we've been saying all along, we are courageous together. So today uh, we continue, like I said, with the, the second commandment. And, and let me just ask you, do you believe that it's important to live by the Ten Commandments? Are the Ten Commandments something that you would say, you know, they, these are so important that, that we need to live by them. Now, if you're a follower of Christ and you've been to church and you read the Bible, you would say, yeah, th those are really important. But I think many people in society as well would say, yeah, those are pretty foundational. And if they're important for you, let me ask you this. How many of the commandments can you name right now? That could be a fun little exercise if you're gathered around some others, some friends or family. Maybe hit pause or come back and say, can I name the Ten Commandments? And you might say, um, thou shalt not. We always get that, that part right. And we think about what, what are the things, all the things we, we're not supposed to do. Uh, that's right, not supposed to kill. Uh, not supposed to steal. Um, thou shalt not. Maybe think of some others. Commit adultery. Is there something about coveting, wanting your neighbor's house or wife? Yeah, don't covet. Don't, don't lie. Um, and then we start getting a little rusty. Maybe there's something in there about, about parents, and honor and parents. And all of a sudden we're going, oh, how do I come up with 10? We say they're important in our lives. We say they're foundational. But if we don't know them, how can we live by them? How can we help those, these commandments of God shape our lives? And so what we're going to be looking at and have been already as we started is that these commandments aren't meant to be limitations to how we live life, but they're really meant to show us how to live a life of freedom and of fullness. And as we say at Meadow Park, life to the fullest in Christ, our, our passion. And so in these summer months, as we, in these weeks, as we are walking through these Ten Commandments, I hope that you will continue to hear God's love for you and the desire for you to live out these commandments to the fullest each and every day. Well, last week we began with the first commandment. And the first commandment was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. God says, I am your one, I am your only God. And that is so foundational. And today's second commandment comes right alongside of it. It's kind of a, a parallel and, and works together. And the second commandment, and I think we kind of imagine the Ten Commandments, you know, wanting to hear those in that, that King James um, English, the, that old English. And in, in the King James, the second commandment says this, thou shall not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. What does that mean? What's, uh, what's God talking about here in, in, in the New Living Translation, which is what I mostly use, uh, is in Exodus 20, verse four, it says this, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens, or on the earth, or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. And so this, uh, th this commandment continues, and, and, and we'll read more of, of the explanation behind it and work our way through that as we move along this morning, but talking about no images, no idols before God. And so today, as we look at the second commandment, we're going to call it, Accept No Substitutes. Accept no substitutes. We're going we're to look at that in its context. And uh, today, I just ask that, like every, every time we gather and listen to God's word, that we would open our hearts to allow God to speak in. And just to declare that to him this morning, wherever you are, let's just pray and ask God, Lord, would you open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us as we listen to these commandments that you found so important to share as foundations for living as free people honoring you. Open our hearts to hear where we are out of step and where, God, you lovingly draw us to experience the fullness of life. Help us to hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, thou shalt not have any graven images, idols, any of those things. Is this commandment still relevant today? Some of us might be wondering. I mean, I get it. And ancient people where they maybe, you know, have been worshiping idols and carvings. And does this really make sense today in, in modern day America? In the year 2020, I mean, what, are, what idols do we have? We have American Idol in the, its 895th season. And how many of those actually have become idols or idolized? Or maybe you think of, uh, the, you know, the 300th season of Survivor, the immunity idol, something that everyone desires on that game because it gives them special powers. But in our daily life, do we have idols? 
We look around our house, we might say, well, we do have certain images of things in the heavens above or, or on the earth or in the sea. Maybe you came home from Florida from spring break and you have a carved wooden dolphin. <laughs> is that a carved image of something under the sea? Is that, is that what God's talking about here? Well, let's begin and look at this context and we're going to come back to our idols and the things that we worship. So in context, what we have to remember is that the Israelites who were following the story, who, who God gave these commandments to, they were in slavery for 400 years under the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt, where they lived as a people and began to grow and prosper. Well, not really prosper, but began to grow, but were then as slaves. And in those 400 years, as God's chosen people, in some ways lost some of their identity. And as might be the case over 400 years, they began to see the culture and the climate around them in Egypt, the dominant culture, the one that they were actually the slave labor to help build up. And so in this context, they were in Egypt and Egypt's religion and Egypt's culture had many gods. And, and historians say that as many as 2,000 gods and goddesses, gods for, for everything from the sea, from the sky, from the earth, from the plants to the trees, to different animals represented as humans, represented as, as, as different creatures. And so this is the context in which they lived for 400 years and they saw all these other gods around them. And what I think is so powerful is as they're now wandering in the desert, they're two months in and they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments. What they have just experienced in relation to those gods is, is earth shattering. As the Egyptians worshiped and, and, and had all these representations of their gods, they just came out of an experience where God just trumped them all. What God did demonstrate, when you think about the, uh, the story of the Exodus, when you think about their slavery in Egypt and when Moses comes, and we, if you remember the 10 plagues, those 10 plagues directly confronted the powers and the gods and goddesses that the Egyptians had. And so even when we think about this, this first plague where the Nile was turned to blood, the Nile River, the Nile was the, was the lifeblood of, of the community, of Egypt. I mean, it was, it was prized for the life that it brought, the fertility, the fertile crescent, all those things that, that we think about when it comes to the Nile. And there was a God associated with the Nile as well. And this God's name was Kunim. And he was the, the God over, again, life of, of the river and flowing. And when that turned to blood... And it killed off the fish and the, everything living. And it, and it represented that his power was broken. That this God cannot save you, but there is a God more powerful. Or we think about the plague of the frogs. Frogs were revered and, and frogs were, were held to a high honor. There was a goddess of frogs, actually. And her name was, was uh, Hecate or something like that. <laughs> and she had the form of, of a frog. And, and it was this idea that that now in this plague of frogs, frogs were everywhere and, and to the point they were dying and people were stepping on them and, and there was no control over that. And again, it was like saying, your gods are powerless against this. Or we think about the darkness. When, when darkness covered the, covered the earth, when darkness covered Egypt and, and, and the fear that arose, well, that came right to the heart of their most powerful God. And that was Ra or Re or different forms of that. As a matter of fact, this was the God of light. This was the God of the sun and the sun giving its, the rays, you know, giving life to the earth. It was the ultimate power. And here darkness showed that Ra has no power. And Ra was the name given or, or even taken by the pharaohs, incorporated into their names like Ramesses, Ra in the beginning of that word, because they were the sons of, of God. They were gods themselves. And even in this Exodus, God demonstrated not only the 10 plagues and the power of of our one true God over all the other gods, even this last God, Pharaoh, was, was shown to not be a God. When, when he was um, followed in pursuit, he followed the, the, uh, the Israelites into the Red, Red Sea and God closed the sea over him saying, there are no other gods that have power over this God. And so we see this amazing display of God's power and we read about it all throughout the Bible. When the, the Bible tells us that he is the God above all other gods, he is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. He's over them all. And throughout scripture, this is such an important foundation for our faith as a monotheistic faith. There is only one God. And this was very important for the Israelites, one, coming out of this context. Well, if these aren't the gods that can, can save us or do anything, then who is? Well, there's the one God. But God also knew that going forward, this is an important commandment to follow because the pressure is going to continue to come 
to, to bow down and to worship other gods because even in the area around them, in Canaan and with the Assyrians and other empires around, they worshiped other gods. Think about the god Baal. Baal was the god that represented power and privilege. And Baal, even to this day, I visited a, a, an ancient city in Lebanon called Baal Bek, named after this Phoenician god and the temple that, that is there. And you see that, that influence of, of these gods that give us power and prestige or, or other gods around them. You think about Astra. She was the, the goddess of sex and fertility. Molech was a god that kids were sac- children were sacrificed to. And this was the experience around them. And God's saying, not for you, not in this way. You will have one God and no other images before me. In Jesus' time, the time of Paul in the New Testament, of course, there were many gods. It was the time of the Roman Empire. We, we all know about, maybe you studied in, in, uh, in school, <laughs> Greek mythology, Roman mythology, the Greek culture at the time. We think about the neighboring Syrians, all had different gods representing these very things. Think about Zeus, right, representing power. And, and we think about um, just, you know, beauty and, and you've got Athena and you've got all these different gods that, that are that, that constantly were, were vying for people's attention and for power. And the goddess Artemis, Aphrodite, you've got um, the god Mammon, wealth, and, and, and all of this focus is so important for people. We want to pursue these things. We want blessings in these things. And so gods are prayed to help me in these different areas. And we need the God to, to speak into that. And, and, and here God is saying, I'm your one-stop shop. There are no other gods. Get rid of these, these idols around. And Jesus affirms that in the New Testament when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me in John 14, 6, right? He's saying there's only one, one God in whom life is found, in whom direction is found. And today we find ourselves wanting to create <laughs> our own religion, our own gods, when we pull from different things. And, and what God is saying, look, he says, I'm unrepresentable by anything. Nothing can contain me. I will not be limited by some image, by some form, some function, some place. I am beyond that. The creator cannot be defined by his creation. Imagine, you know, saying, you know, and, and, and a potter makes, makes a, a piece of pottery, makes a cup, and you say, this cup represents the creator. Well, it's a part of his creation, but It just is a poor substitute for the actual artist, the one who created. And God is saying, I will not be contained. And you know what the irony is? Is while Moses is receiving these very commandments and this very commandment, what's happening down among the Israelites? They're getting impatient and they're they're rising up and they're asking for someone to save them and someone to, to guide them. And they make a golden calf. They're creating an image and they begin to dance and to worship and to, 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 to worship it. And, and we just see that there's this propensity in us as human beings to want something tangible in front of us that, that we, we, we get hung up on the physical around us. And we long to, to, to put our allegiance somewhere. And so where do we place that? Well, Jesus again affirmed in the New Testament, just as we're reading here, he says, look, I'm not going to be contained and some idol, some image isn't going to be enough to represent who I am. As he's talking to the woman at the well, In John chapter 4, verse 24, he says, For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And God's saying, look, I'm everywhere. I'm not just in one place, and and I'm spirit and I'm truth. I'm I'm more than an image. I'm more than a God of just over one area. I'm I'm over all areas. And so again, we look in, in history, and we see these different gods. These are gods and idols to power, to beauty, to sex, to wealth, to protection, to security. We don't need those anymore today, do we, right? We, we're not concerned about that stuff, right? I mean, that was just for ancient cultures. I mean, that was just kind of silly that the way that they dealt with those through having different idols and things they worshiped. Well, we know better than that today. But these are still the things that draw our attention. You see, the issues are the same, but the images aren't that obvious. So, for example, um, if you want to go study a culture and, and anthropologists and others, historians, they go through and they study cultures, they observe, what do they see? And, and imagine um, aliens coming to the earth and observing us here in Columbus. And they spend a week with us. They don't know our language. They can't understand. They're just trying to, based on what they see and what they observe, they're, they're going to try to deduce some things about our culture. 
And they're trying to understand everything from our economics to our religion. And, and, and they're trying to understand what is it we worship. And as they're talking among themselves, we're able to have some special technology to understand their language. And, and they start observing that, that these humans, they seem to be really attracted to these, these idols. They actually have idols here in the year 2020 on, on earth in Columbus. And they have these idols in different sizes. They're actually rectangular in shape. They're, they're fairly thin, but they come in lots of different sizes. And as a matter of fact, they, they carry them around with them many, many times. When they, when they wake up in the morning, they keep these idols right on their bedside table, right next to them. And it seems to be the last thing they, they, they worship at night and the first thing they worship in the morning. They, they get up in the morning and they grab these, these little rectangular items and they put them in their hands and it almost looks like they're, they're, they're praying or communicating in some way. And, and as they're engaging with these, these idols, their, their face begins to, to glow and, and they seem to be so drawn into that. And, and, and then after some time of devotion to that, they, they, they stick them in their pockets and they take them with them wherever they go. And even when they're around other people, like with friends or, or coworkers, they're in a conversation, many times they, they will just take time, even in, in down moments, and, and will begin to, to worship. Or maybe even at dinner with family around and their kids, everyone seems to take out these idols and, and spend time with them. And then they have these idols in, in different shapes too, and are different sizes that, that, that there's larger versions of a, in the homes of people. And it seems that furniture is all oriented around, around this idol and much time is spent and there seems to be learning and knowledge and, and, and just consumption that's, that, that, that's taking place. They even create these special buildings with seats that are all geared towards these screens where people will spend two hours just, just worshiping at these idols. You see, our, our TVs, our, our movies, our, our phones could be viewed as idols. As we look at these things, as we spend time, our time, our devotion, our money, our energy, as we'll see even throughout the rest of this message here, these are keys to speaking into what is important to us. Or maybe those aliens observe us on a weekend in the fall and they say there's something about these weekends in that, in that city of Columbus where we're on a, on a Saturday. It seems like thousands of people begin to flock towards this, this worship place. It's in the shape of a horseshoe and, and, and outside there's all these altars of, of smoke. Sacrifices are being made. There, there, are, there are, 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 are pigs and, and cows that, are being, that, that have been slaughtered and, and they've been put into shapes of long cylinders and, and round circles and they're being offered on these altars as smoke goes up and then the people eat them. And, uh, and then they put like war paint on their face and, and then they go inside and, and they all seem to focus onto these, these gods on, on this grassy field. And they raise their hands in worship and cheers at different times and, and celebrate together. When we look back, what's important? Where are our values? And not that these things are bad, but it's so easy for us to say this doesn't pertain to us. But these ideas of, of power, of wealth, of recognition, of, of love and sex and peace and, 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 and contentment and trying to find those things, we see that even in our own lives. And we may not have graven images, but our images just look different today. They might look like, like the perfect home that you're pursuing and trying to create. It might look like the gym that we go to. It might look like having a certain amount of money in, in your 401k. It might look like food. It might look like a degree or a corner office. It might look like a car with, with a certain badge on it that we are pursuing and these idols that we have in front of us. You see this desire for, again, for, for power and for, for love and for wealth. Those are the things that when we have them and, and the pursuit of them in a nation like America where capitalism reigns supreme forward movement and advancement, these things can become idols that we worship. And when we attain them and when we achieve them, I think what we're seeing and hearing and outcry in our nation today is we create systems for those of privilege and those that have received them that we may continue to receive them. And that when we worship at these gods, everything else becomes secondary. We don't put God in the first place. We don't put other people in the first place. And we're hearing that not only do we need to leverage our, our privilege, but what do we do with that? How do we affect others? But uh, as, as a good friend of mine and pastor Rod Stafford said last weekend to his church, he was talking about this privilege and how God laid it down, not only to help others, but to lay it down for others. And 
he's saying, how much do we value and, and long for these things? Here's what he said. He said, do we love our privilege more than we love our neighbor? More than seeking justice? More than, than seeking mercy? You see, when we pursue these other ends at all cost, it doesn't matter if people get in the way, we want to keep those things. And unless God begins to break us down in the second commandment and the first commandment, remind us to put God in the first place, it begins to order the rest of our lives and to see the needs of those around us. So, the, so let's continue to look at the rest of this passage. In Exodus 20 verse 5, it continues, you must not bow down to them or worship them. This idea of, of worship, it's attributing worth. That's the root of that word, attributing worth, attributing value. What's important to us? So we often think of worship as just an expression of singing or raising hands or being lost in, in spirit. But things we worship are things we put worth onto, things that we think are, are valuable, where we give our affection, where we give our devotion, we give our attention. And when we think about bowing down, again, we might not say, I don't literally bow down to some of these things, but, but bowing down is an act of, of honor, an act of respect, an act of allegiance and acknowledging something is, is, is more important, is something we're willing to pursue our lives after. So those questions are, what are we worshiping? What are we bowing down to? And God's saying, don't do that for any other gods. And then he tells us why. He says, why? We read that in, as the verse continues in verse 5. He says, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Now, you might read these words and go, well, that sounds kind of, uh, kind of, kind of arrogant or maybe it sounds kind of petty, like God saying, I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God. Maybe, maybe it's like he's a teenage girl who's jealous about something or he jealously wants something that somebody else has. But at the root of this, again, is this desire for our love. This desire for, for our, our relationship with him, that, that we would pour our heart out to him. As a husband, I think my wife wants me to be jealous for her. If she was out uh, on a date with another man, having a good time and being flirty and doing whatnot, and somebody, a friend of mine called me and said, Mark, you're, this is what your wife's doing. And I kind of go, well, that's fine. You know, I know she loves me. I love her. and It's all good. And I didn't care. No, I would be jealous, not jealous of that other guy. I would be jealous for her love, jealous to say that is reserved for me, not for anyone else, just as she desires that from me, that we don't share that love with someone else, what's reserved for that person. That's what God is saying. Do not take your love and affection and begin to parse it out to all these other gods and other things. I want relationship with you. I'm jealous for your love. There was a song some years ago called, Oh, How He Loves. And there's a line in there that says, he is jealous for me. And it's all about this love that God has. And we would sing that. And the original version, I think many churches changed it, said um, he, that, that, that God's love is so much so that there's this line, when heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. <laughs> many people were like, yeah, that doesn't communicate uh, love quite the way that I am, uh, imagine it. And uh, it was changed uh, to say an unforeseen kiss. But it talked about these different ways that God is just jealous. He longs for us to be in relationship. And so even this commandment, we see what we said last week, that the commandments aren't a condition that do these things and I will love you. He's saying, I already love you. You're my people. I'm jealous for this love. And I just ask you, give your hope, your love, your allegiance to me and to me alone. And then this commandment, unlike some of the others, again, it adds a lot more to it. And I want to cover these last couple pieces here as we go on in verse 5. And this seems maybe like an odd connection, but then he says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Now we might be saying, okay, what, what's the connection? He just went from idols and worship and, and uh, being jealous for a love. And all of a sudden now he's talking about generations and generational sin. And he's saying the sin of, for those who reject, that's going to reject me. That's going to be taken out to the third and fourth generations. What we see very clearly here is that, is this, idolatry is a root sin with significant consequences. Idolatry is a root sin with significant consequences, not only for our life, but for the lives around us. Where, why is this a root sin? Martin Luther, the great reformer of the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago, he said this, he said, you cannot violate the other nine commandments without breaking this one first idolatry, 
self-centeredness, what we want for us, giving our allegiance to other gods, pursuing other things, bowing our knee and, and worshiping other things. That, that is what leads us to these others, to stealing, to killing, to coveting. God wants our allegiance first. And he's saying when we don't put God first, when we reject him, he says there's consequences that follow down to the generations and three, third and fourth generation. That's that's typically how many generations are alive at one point in time in a family. That's the kids, the parents, the grandparents, and the great-grandparents. That's four generations. I'm talking about 80 years or so. And he's saying that as parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, we have a responsibility. That when, that when we reject God, when we put other things first, when our kids see us idolizing other things, worshiping at the altar of success in our business and our work world, for advancement, for career, for, for things, for status, for vacations, for, for material stuff. They see that and they, they see those are the things that are most important. You don't, if you don't know what's important, ask your kids. Ask them what they see you valuing in your time and your energy. But those impacts are for generations. Now, the sin itself is not the sin that the children now have. It's the consequences of that sin. It's the impact of that sin that has generational effect. And we see that in other sins, affected over generations. I witnessed this firsthand even in in recent history. When I was a a Bible school student between uh, college and seminary, I spent a year in Germany. And I was there about four or five years after the, the wall came down and um, East and West Germany were, had been reunited for some years. And we were sent to a small city in Demin, Germany, in the north of, uh, of Germany, former East Germany. And there we were to help hold a, um, a televised uh, revival that was going on throughout all Germany with great speakers and worship. And, and we were going to help in this community. And, and I noticed the temperature, the climate, the spiritual climate was so different when we crossed over into the East at that time. And that's not saying that much because West Germany, formerly West Germany, was already struggling with post-Christendom and, and religious temperature there was already difficult, but the East was even more so. And we saw the impact of communism and socialism and, and, the, and, and the pushing away of religion and the state being the religion. And that was just 45 years. That's about two generations We can see the climate affect an entire nation. And and so God is saying here, be a nation, be a people that that puts me first and that roots out other idols and things that come in the way. Because then he contrasts it very dramatically because there's there's gonna be a blessing on the other side. In verse six, he says, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. What a contrast. Contrast a thousand generations. We can change our family tree. We can impact nations. We can impact generations when we put God first, when we route out the idols, the things that compete for his attention. And he says, when you love me and obey me, when we love God and out of relationship and we say, God, we want what you have for us in life. We want to experience it. And so we want to obey these commandments to the best of our abilities, not because you, so that you'll love us, but because you love us. And here's the thing, God sends us Jesus to help us do that. We can't on our own. We struggle. We know sin is a challenge and we come up short all the time, but that's why we need Jesus. So let me just make this real practical here at the end. We need to begin by identifying our little G gods. We have so many little G gods that for some of us have become our big G God. Even though we say we're Christians, even though we follow God, even good things that can come in the way of, of putting God first, even as a pastor. And I hear this from many different leaders. You know, we serve God in the church, but what can become a bigger, a little G God that we put before God is the church itself, is the ministry itself. This is our career. This is what we do, just like others in other careers. It's, it's so easy, even within faith, to get things backwards and to say the most important thing is to put God first in my life, in my relationship, in my worship. And so we have to ask ourselves and confess and say, what is it that I'm putting before God. And it comes back to these ancient gods, time, money, energy. How do we know whether we have other gods or other idols or images that we put before them? Let me ask you three questions here, three statements that I want you to to discuss and to think about um, with those around you or even on your own. The first is this, to, to find out. Blank keeps me from being involved in church more often. 
Blank keeps me from being involved in church more often. Now, it's not all about church involvement. And by church involvement, I don't just mean Sunday mornings, but I mean being involved in, in a community of other believers, a small group. Uh, it's about being involved in serving, using your gifts in the church, outside the church. It's about being the body of Christ. Blank keeps me from being more involved. Now, you get a pass. We all got to write coronavirus in there. It's kept us from being involved in different ways we may have liked over the last three months. But we found different ways, didn't we? But what is it? And, and, and when you think about the normal flow of, of life, what it was, and hopefully what we can get back to at some level, but, but what is it that's kept you? Is it, is it a club sport for your t- kids? I mean, over generations, you're saying, we will reorder our lives around this sport, but not around God or church. What does that begin to communicate to your kids about what comes first? Maybe it's a, it's a cabin. Maybe it's, a, it's a, a retreat that you have. Maybe it's a boat. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's, I, I don't know what it is, but, but the things that you're pursuing, that you're finding those things are what I put in first, and then I fit church and God around that versus putting the big rock in first saying, this is most important. So what are those things? What is, what is it that you're putting in that place? And, and hear me out. This is not that these are bad things. Our, our sports for children and, and some of the enjoyment of, of life is, is a great thing on weekends and, and throughout the week. But where is it in relationship to God first in your life? Second is this, excluding my basic needs, think about your mortgage and other things like that, how, I could be more generous for the things of God, the church and the needs of people around me, if I didn't spend as much money on. Going right to where we spend our time, where we spend our money. Money leads our heart. Jesus said that wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. And so where are we spending our money? When we step back and say, what are we willing to sacrifice for in order to have? Are we willing to do that after we've put God first? Or do we do those things first and then say, whatever's left over for you, God, I might be able to help somebody. I may be able to sponsor a child. I may be able to give to the church. I may be able to help at the, the, the food pantry. But this is about priorities. And we step back and say, God, what are these idols we're trying to identify? If you really look at, look at your, um, your bank statement, look at your credit card statement and say, of all the discretionary things, where am I prioritizing the giving and the money that I have? Third is this. If I only had blank, I would have happiness, peace, and contentment. Oh, this is a tough question. If I only had blank, there's always something that seems to pull us forward. If I only had a little bit more, if I had X dollars in my 401k or in my retirement account, then I would feel satisfaction. If my house only had one more bedroom, if I lived in that neighborhood, in that part of town, in that, on that street, things would look different. If I only had a raise, if I was be given that position, if I would have that degree, if I would make that team, if I would get these grades, what is it that we think will bring us that peace and contentment. If I only had that relationship, those are the things we begin to pursue. And God is saying, put me first. Don't put these other things in my place. What is the number one competitor for Jesus in your life? Ashley Woodridge said it this way. If you uproot an idol and fail to plant Jesus in its place, the idol will grow back. You see, it's not only about identifying, it's about replacing, right? It's removing it and replacing it and saying, I put you, Jesus, in the first place. No one else takes that place but you. And even Jesus said in Matthew 6, of all these other things, put God first, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This is where we find peace and contentment, where we find joy and generosity, where we find a a refilling of our time and spirit because of where we spend it and who we spend it with and putting God first. These commandments remind us of freedom and that God is the first in our life and that we shall accept no substitutes. Let's do some soul searching today. Let's have some conversation with your kids, with a spouse, with a friend, with others from your church and our community groups. What is vying for our affection and for our love and for our worship? And how can we put Jesus first? I'm going to close with a passage from uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Just reminding us that 
The only idol, the only God, the only thing that we should have that we worship is no idol, no thing. It is Jesus himself. It is God himself. And we read in Philippians chapter 2, after Jesus humbled himself, took on the form of a servant when he gave up all of his privileges and all of his rights, and he served us and he loved us out of relationship. This is the God that came to us and why we worship him. It says in verse 9, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in earth and on earth, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Sounds like the first, that commandment, doesn't it? The second commandment. In heaven, on earth, and under the earth, every knee should bow, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's accept no substitutes. Let's take some steps today to put God first and to route out the idols that we see around us and put them in their proper place. Some we need to get rid of altogether. And others are good things, but they need to be seen in light of God first. If you don't know Christ, if you don't have that surrender, if you've never found that freedom of saying, God, I put it all at your feet. Jesus, thank you for the freedom you gave me. Why not today? Not just remove these idols, but replace that with Christ at the center of your life, from whom all life flows, the love and his goodness. And if you're a follower of Christ, it's so easy for us to allow the secondary and tertiary things to, sl to slip in, to replace and to take higher priority. And we want to put God in that first place, place, to be a community of believers, to be a church, Meadow Park Church, a light in this community of people seeking God first, denying all other gods. We put him above any person, above any institution, above any political party, above any career, above any paycheck, above any status, above any symbol. We bow before none other than Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us these amazing foundations in life. Just reminding us, God, that, that when we put you first, we don't have to pray to a thousand different gods or idols. We don't have to look for our hope and fulfillment and, and guidance from a thousand different sources, God. You are our one and only source. Lord, I ask for forgiveness where we allow other things to catch our eye, to, to grab our heart, our time and our allegiance, our money, and we think this will bring fulfillment. And Father, in the end, we're, we're just empty and we're still searching because those gods just don't bring it. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to put you in the first place. We love you, God. We surrender our lives to you anew today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you want us to help you take that next step or just celebrate with us, let us know that, that you've taken a step with Christ. Just, just click in one of the links below or comment if you're watching on Facebook. Let us know, I follow Christ. And let us know so that we can help you take some of those next steps whatever that next step may be. We'd love to hear from you and, and, and just ask that God would continue to be more and more at the forefront of your life. I'm so glad to be able to see you here online, but as we're opening back up, we hope that we have the opportunity to connect with you again in person very soon and that we can grow and continue to be in relationship together as a church. I love you. I hope you have a wonderful week. Let's be courageous together.
just want to thank you for joining us today. I know God has been speaking and so I pray that it spoke to your heart and, and anytime we encounter God in this, it's natural to want to respond. We want to move closer to Him. And so for some of you today, maybe this is the first step and so maybe it's just committing to coming back next week. And maybe for some of us, it's I really encountered Jesus today and I want to start that relationship with Him. For some of you, maybe you're going, you know what? I need to make a stronger commitment. I wanna be baptized. Or maybe it's just, you know, I'm committing to really uh, just spending time with God daily. Whatever it is, we we'll encourage you to go to uh, meadowpark.org forward slash next steps. Great way for you to connect with us and help us to walk alongside you in these next steps because uh, God doesn't want it to end here today. He wants it to continue on. And so we just thank you for being here. I want to encourage you to join us every day. We have a uh, morning time of prayer and devotional that happens at 8 a.m. live on Facebook, or you can catch it any time of the day, but we'd love to have you join us and, and be a part of that. We're excited to go out from this place now and to live life courageous together. We're excited for what God did here today, but more excited for what he's gonna do as we look to the week ahead. Mm -hmm.